Um, sure, I'll take one. I printed so off one. But Williams Community Forest Project. Uh, our mission here in Williams is to educate, recreate, and um, take good care of our public lands and private lands. And some of our um, board of directors are here. And we have Janice over here in the turquoise shirt. We have Cheryl up here uh, behind you and Josh Weber of Green Path, um, Green Path Landworks. Landworks, thank you. And we're all volunteers and we all want to um, help improve the environment and do as much um, uh, community service as possible for the forest, the farmlands, and community. And I'd like to introduce today uh, Kelpie Wilson, who is from Cape Junction area, and she's going to tell you a little bit about herself and what we're going to do today. Thank you. Oh, Barry, board of directors. Thanks, Claudia. Uh huh. Um, well, I'll talk, say a bit about myself, and then I'd like to hear everybody else's name here and a bit about you too. So, uh, I live in Cape Junction area. I've been in this area for how long have I been here, Barry? <laughs> Well, I met you back in 87. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, came here to protect ancient forests, basically, and um, evolved into different aspects of environmental work, but kind of around the time of the Biscuit Fire in 2002, I realized that climate change is really the issue, and um, also got really disgusted with politics and wanted to just focus bioregionally on growing things in my backyard. So biochar became a really perfect avenue for both of those things for me because it addresses cli climate issues in a really profound way and also addresses soil, um, the building soils for uh, resilience and um, self-sufficiency. So that's why I'm into it. Uh, my background with biochar, I first heard of it in probably 2006 when stories started coming out in the news about Terra Preta, um, the Amazonian uh, experience with biochar. And uh, I was working as a reporter at that time uh, and a writer, and so I started just investigating it and writing stories about it for online news sources and other magazines. And then in 2008, I uh, got hired by the International Biochar Initiative, which was the group that was kind of championing or advocating for biochar was mostly a bunch of academic soil scientists who've been studying it. So I worked for them for four, four years and the um, biggest thing I did there was um, <coughs> over manage the process of creating biochar standards. So um, also by way of background my degree is in mechanical engineering so I had a pretty solid technical background in um, thermal sciences. Um, and engineering in general. So um, I managed the process of creating that standards document and we did it really similar to the way um, ASTM or ISO, if you know those about those standards bodies. Um, so it was really interesting. I learned a lot in that process. And then um, a couple years ago, I went out on my own as a consultant and I worked for some of the bigger biochar production companies. Um, consulting with them on um, biochar science. So that's what I do. I also really love to bring this, you know, teach these, these methods and these ideas to small farmers and gardeners everywhere because I think that's where the biochar sort of revolution is, is really going to be happening um, because biochar is something really anybody can do. That's one of the most exciting things about it. So that's me and my background, and I'd just like to hear a, a word or two from everybody, where you're, your name, where you're from, and what you do. Um, I'm Jim Hall, and I live in Grants Pass. I moved there in 2013. I grew up in Hawaii, though. 
but um, I've been involved with a small farmers union and different organizations to present kind of the same thing, biochar and soil health and that sort of thing. On Maui, I retired from the electric company and um, just hadn't gotten involved with anything over here until I saw this brochure and, and thought it would be a great chance to see because there is differences locally with the weather and the soil and everything, so nice to see it. Oh, I'm Charlie Newsom. I'm with uh, Josephine County Master Gardeners. I'm the current vice president, and I'm interested from the home garden scenario. I saw we recently had an instructor talking about uh, this type of method used in ancient days, and I got interested in it, and that's the reason I'm here. And uh, I'm Peter Fernarelli. I'm also with uh, Josephine County Master Gardeners, and uh, I'm here because Charlie said, "Come on." What are we saying now? Just your name. I was over there working. Oh, Barry Barry Martin, and I lived and uh, worked uh, in the this area since '87, doing a lot of Earth First stuff initially, and then uh, kind of semi-retired. <laughs> from the activist community. <laughs> but I'm still active in, uh, in some organizations here in Williams. So back here. Oh, I'm Don Jando. I'm also a master gardener. And uh, I retired up here about uh, 10 years ago to Williams. And uh, I'm interested, well, from the garden perspective of how to make our gardens better, and also how, in terms of how you use it in restoration activities. <clears throat> My name's Daniel, and uh, I live here in Williams. I grew up in the Willamette Valley, and uh, been small farming, gardening on and off for a while, for a few years, and um, I'm interested in uh, discovering uh, better ways to uh, to live more sustainably and, and to and <clears throat> yeah <laughs> I'm Cheryl Pooner I um, live in Williams um, on the board of directors as Claudia said for the Williams Community Forest Project my husband and I have a small farm called Cherry Gulch Farm here and um, so biochar is a useful thing for us in our uh, farm um, primarily, I got interested in, and did a course actually with Kelpie a couple years ago in biochar because of um, my interest in fuels reduction in our area and in other places and looking at ways that um, with fuels reduction that it can happen in a way that's sustainable so that we're not causing air pollution and, and <coughs> burning the, the wood. And um, so, any. Any further information is always good. Uh, Claudia, I agree with Cheryl on everything she said. <laughs> yeah, especially with public land management and the future of the carbon imprint pollution with burning. If we could implement biochar, if that's sustainable or feasible, that would be really interesting to, to work as a partner with BLM or the Forest Service. And um, as for myself, I have Southern Oregon Mediation Center in Grants Pass, and I'm a home gardener. Peter Robb, I'm now from Azalea. Um, I'm an organic gardener and small woodlot owner up there. I've seen the potential of, of uh, biochar just over my eyes to the possibilities, the functionality, the process, how I can incorporate it what I'm trying to achieve in this area. Plus the fact of um, all the local strip logging going on up there, clear cutting and such, and then what they do with the slash afterwards is just a shame. So yeah. I, I see this as a potential for raising awareness and possibly you know, creating a whole new business. You know? So that's fun. My name is Josh Brever. And uh, I live here in Williams on Williams Creek, and I'm involved with trees and fire on a daily basis, supporting my own small business. 
And so I'm looking forward to learning some new methods of um, ways to apply fire to the landscape and make use of all the resources that the forest provides for. oxygen or reduced oxygen and we're going to get way into the science of that later on but that's what it is and so what happens in that thermochemical conversion process or that baking process well what happens is the carbon that's in the biomass you know and biomass is is mainly carbohydrates and um, hydrocarbons that carbon when it's heated, will link up into these what are called fused carbon rings. It's also called aromatic carbon. These are terms from organic chemistry that can be kind of confusing, but the essence of it is that um, you bake the biomass, gases are released uh, that include mainly hydrogen and oxygen. So the hydrogen and oxygen leave from the carbohydrate and you're left with the carbon. The carbon atoms fuse together in these hexagonal rings. And that is actually a, a, um, a microscopic picture of some of those rings fused together. There's amazing imaging that's going on now in science and it's this beehive hexagonal pattern. So here, I, can, I, can you all see from back there? I, um, anyway, um, so this kind of shows the process at a molecular scale and then at a cellular, cellular scale. What happens when you take the biomass, which at a molecular scale is composed of lignin, cellulose, and hemicellulose, but lignin is the, the, the part of biomass that has the most carbon that's already fused in carbon rings. So you can see, you know, there's a lot of these hexagonal shapes in the lignin molecule. And when you add heat, all these other things that are attached, the hydrogen and oxygen vaporize, and the, the carbon molecules link up into these fused rings. And they tend to form these sheets, these little sheets. And they'll kind of jumble up together, you know, kind of zooming out a little bit, from this view, they'll jumble up together into these little sections of what we call graphene sheets. And, and um, then, uh, you know, if a, a biochar particle might look at like this, a whole jumbled bunch of these little graphene sheets. So, and then the cool thing about it is that at the cellular scale, it retains the structure of the plant. If you're using wood, you know, you have the whole vascular system structure of the plant that's retained. And so you end up with porosity at different scales. Uh, my, nano, micro, and macro porosity in this material. And that has really interesting implications for, for um, life forms colonizing it. And it also provides incredible amounts of surface area where different kinds of chemical reactions happen. So that's kind of the, the key to what biochar is and what it does. Um, so, on a big scale, what are the benefits of biochar? Now that we know kind of what it is, well, these are the benefits that, that uh, the academic scientists have kind of come up with when they think about how to, inter how to actually integrate biochar into our, um, our agricultural and in industrial systems. 
but the kind of things it can do. And you might even think of activated carbon because that's a material a lot of people are familiar with. You know it's good for filtration and odor control and other things. So um, what biochar is good for is waste management, <coughs> mitigation of pollution and also climate change, soil improvement of course, you know I think that's why most of you are here, and then also energy production which can be a byproduct of the biochar production process. So those are sort of social and, and financial benefits of biochar that, that could be realized if it's integrated into our current systems. And this is another look at biochar benefits, this nice little graphic of a tree that combines the benefits into, it's probably hard for you guys in the back to see, but atmospheric benefits and soil benefits. So soil benefits include things like decreased nutrient runoff because biochar will grab nutrients. Um, and improved soil water holding capacity, that's probably one of the biggest benefits of biochar right now that people are realizing it can really reduce your use of water um, and then in, as far as the atmospheric benefits it can reduce greenhouse gas emissions when it's placed in soil it um, stabilizes carbon from biomass that would otherwise be emitted as co2 so it's carbon sequestration and of course it can absorb various pollutants and it's very useful in remediation <coughs> So here's just another little, here's a quote I really like that just gives another clue as to why biochar could be so important in all these systems. Because life is based on carbon. And I love this quote from this, this um, book, um, Courtney White, author of Grass, Soil, and Hope said, carbon is promiscuous. It forms more compounds than any other element with almost 10 million compounds discovered to date. A tiny fraction of all that are theoretically possible. Carbon especially likes to bond with other small molecules, including carbon molecules, carbon atoms. So it's capable of forming these long chains of stable and complex molecules that are important to life. Um, and that's why it's found in so many different forms on Earth. So with that, I'm going to actually skip forward because we're going to go out in the field here um, and burn some things. So I'm going to skip forward to the part of this presentation where I talk about energy. We'll do the other part after lunch. So to get us started on making biochar, um, we start with the, with the benefit that I mentioned in the beginning with those four uh, circles, biochar and energy. So this is a picture of someone who's making biochar on their wood stove, and they just take a tin can, put some sticks in it, close it up put a lid on it or put two, one can inside another, poke a few holes in it to let the gas out, otherwise it'll explode. <laughs> Toss it in your wood stove and it's like a little oven in your wood stove. Your wood stove is gonna get to be about six, 700, 800 degrees in there in the burning wood and it will bake that biomass and make charcoal. So anybody can make charcoal in a wood stove with some tin cans. A question about that? Yeah. So the wood is not inside the tin can? It is inside it is. the tin can. That's called a retort. I'm not going to talk a lot about retorts, actually, in this presentation. Um, but that's um, because I'm more actually interested in, in open fire methods and gasifiers. But that is, that is kind of one of the, that is the traditional way of making biochars in a retort. So you have an enclosed in a, in a vessel heat is transferred through the walls of that vessel and it's like a little oven. So um, I'm going to talk about what are really probably more practical ways of making biochar. And um, here's one way that, uh, and this has been pretty successful, it's a biomass gasifier in the Central Valley. There's, there are now I think four of these in the Central Valley. Wow. It makes electricity. They're running off of uh, orchard waste, old busted up pallets and fruit crates. You know, so this is just waste that was either sent to a landfill and they paid a tipping fee for it, and they figured out, well, we could run it in this gasifier and get electricity. 
and actually the, the it makes charcoal as part of the process from an energy standpoint it's an inefficiency but from a soil standpoint it's a co-product so this thing makes energy and biochar it makes a ton per day Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it's just the ash that's kind of left, but it's it's char. Mm -hmm. So here's another way that um, biochar can be made as along with energy, and the, this is a, a typical bioenergy boiler, like we see all all throughout you know our state. You'll find these things. There's one over at Rough and Ready Mill in Cape Junction, small scale, you know, five megawatt plant. Um, you know, we, there's White City, of course, which is a much bigger plant, and we've all heard about these biomass plants that come up from time to time. They want to build new ones, but there's a lot of them already in existence. A lot of them are at sawmills. They're small. They're using sawmill waste, and they use the heat to dry lumber. Sometimes they get electricity out of it, too, but it's just a really standard design of a boiler, and actually, they make a lot of ash. And in fact, there's a lot of this on the market now being sold as biochar. So here's how it works. So you've got wood chips going into this boiler, and it's got there's it's called a chain grate that moves the material through. So you know you have to clean out your wood stove every now and then, right? It gets full of ash. It's the same thing, but it's automat automated. Um, but again, this is an inefficiency of this process. Not all the char ends up getting burned. So, um, and if you actually speed up that grate just a little bit, you can pull more char off of there. So what we're finding is these existing technologies can actually make a lot of biochar while producing energy. I just have to interrupt for a moment yes. and apologize. I just found out the Zumba dancing starts oh. at nine. Oh, mm -hmm. holy cow. And I didn't know that, or we didn't know that. And so there's going to be a lot of noise, oh, but yeah. they're from 9 to 10. So if you want to change the schedule and go away for an hour and come back, that we're going to have a lot of jumping up and down that we oh weren't aware God. of until okay. now. <laughs> well, I this, you know what? Then we'll zip through this. Uh, this is hard, though, because I have a lot to give you before we go out and burn. Keep yeah. going until it gets OK. Yeah. Yeah, anyway. Um, so that was stoves. We don't need to talk about stoves. Um, this is a pyramid kiln that I've developed. It's an open fire method. It doesn't make energy, but it does make heat. And so I call it, you know, social energy because <laughs> and that's important too. Uh -huh. You know, I mean, we evolved standing around the campfire. Um, so, and we'll experience this today. So the, uh, the other benefit of biochar is a way to deal with waste. There's all kinds of waste in our world. Biochar should always be made from waste wherever possible. Um, and so, you know, there's all kinds of things here. Um, and what we're going to talk about, though, is fuel load reduction. So you can burn manure. Yes, you can. And sewage sludge. There are now some very big um, um, sewage treatment plants in California that are starting to pyrolyze sewage sludge which is really nice because it can take care of pathogens, it can take care of right. um, pharmaceuticals, which yeah, is a yeah. huge issue in sewage sludge. It can, yeah, it can break down those molecules. So, so, here's, so this is our concern though. We've got tons of this stuff and um, we're spending a lot of money to dispose of it. You know, up to $2,000 an acre to cut, pile, and burn. And what do we get from that? Well, we get the waste treatment and the fuel load reduction. But we also, as byproducts, get some nasty things. We get smoke, and we get this. You see how this soil here is, is kind of burned down to the mineral soil, so we've destroyed the, the soil um, duff, you know, the mm -hmm. layer there. You know, it's just like punching little holes in the soil wherever you do one of these things. So this is what we're going to do today, and this is the alternative we've been developing to, um, it's not too bad. You're just <laughs> warming up. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we're going we're gonna to experience this different method of burning, and 
have to go through the physics of why this works. But it's, it's dramatically different. And it's just the difference between lighting it on the top versus lighting it on the bottom of the pile. And you can see the difference in the amount of smoke you get when you don't light it on the top. So why, why does this work? So I'm going to dispel two myths here that we all have heard about fire and heat. The first one is heat does not rise. Okay? You might have learned in school that there are three methods of heat transfer. Conduction, radiation, and convection. Well, convection is not a method of heat transfer. Not in a fundamental way that radiation and conduction are. So if you, if, if you need more explanation of what radiation and conduction are, we can talk about it later. But um, convection really is just the movement of hot air. Hot air rises. It's lighter because it, heat makes air molecules expand. And the, so the cold air will sink and the hot air will rise. So it does move heat around, but it does it by physically moving it, like you know, a hot water pipe moves it. But the actual heat transfer is through these, these physical methods of conduction and radiation. And, but because we think heat doesn't rise, that's, or heat rises, that's one of the reasons why we light on the bottom, because we think we'll light the stuff on top on fire better if we put, if we start flame underneath. So here's the second myth, and that is wood does not burn, okay? It doesn't. It really doesn't. What it does, what heat does to wood though, is that it goes through these stages of dr first it dries the material, and as it gets hotter, then all those volatiles are released, the, the hydrogen and oxygen. And so the, the match is a perfect example of this um, because when you strike the match, you have your ignition source, and the wood starts to heat and the gases rise and when the gases there's heat present and there's gas pre the fuel present in the gas and the, when the, those gases rise and get can get oxygen then you get a flame and so um but a couple things happen to make char because you know when you light a match and you just hold it it goes out you end up with a little stick of charcoal especially a wooden kitchen match because the um the flame is on top of the match. It's not underneath the match. It's on top of the match. And so the heat is transferring into the matchstick by radiation, not by convection, by radiation. And that chars it. And then, you know, at the, at the end of the match, the flame has moved on. And you have this end of the match sticking out there. And the char doesn't burn because the heat is gone now, because the flame has moved down the stick. So charcoal does burn, but it won't burn directly under the flame because there's no oxygen there. The flame's sucking up all the oxygen. And it won't burn on the end of the match because it's cooled off and there's not enough heat. So we're going to compete with Zumba here and show a video because I think this will help our general understanding if we know better actually what is a flame, what's going on with that flame. Um, excuse me. Pardon me. No, 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 not up there. I'm down here. Yep. Hello. I am a scientist, and I've come to improve your situation just a bit. See that fire over there? Have you ever really wondered what the flames are from that fire? I mean, look at all of those colors, and you feel that heat. It's hot, right? Well, gee, it must be torture being around all these flames and not knowing what they are. Here, take a look at this cupcake. You see the flame on top of this delicious looking cupcake? You do like cupcakes, don't you? Let's take a closer look, shall we? Fantastic! If we look at the flame on top of this cupcake, we first notice a few things, like all the colors. At the bottom, we have this bluish color, and the top, it's more yellow, orange, and reddish. Also, the flame is hot. Why is it so flaming hot? Well, to answer these questions, you need to know something very important. You see, everything is made of tiny things called atoms. And these things are the building blocks that make up everything. And they're really small. Smaller, 
smaller. Even smaller. Hey, look, you can't even see them. They're so small. Exactly. Anything you can think of is made up of atoms. Yep, this air conditioner is made up of atoms. This delicious popsicle is made up of atoms. This ice water is made up of atoms. Everything is made up of billions and billions of atoms. Now this candle and flame, well, they are made up of three kinds of atoms. Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. The carbon and the hydrogen are locked together to form a solid wax and wick. The oxygen is a gas all around us. Normally, the oxygen doesn't do much to the candle. It just bounces off of the surface, not doing any real damage. But when we add heat, the oxygen atoms go bananas, and they shake the wax like crazy, until finally, with enough force, they snap apart. They leave the candle as a gas, where they mix with the oxygen. Uh-oh. I smell trouble. Well, the fancy science word for all of this is pyrolysis. It's the first thing that needs to happen to get a flame. It's when the fuel turns to a gas. Now, let's see what happens when these hot gases combine. Ladies and gentlemen, in this corner, he was once a solid. Now he's a gas. He's the fuel from the wax. get hit hard enough, they spit out blue light. And because there are lots of atoms getting hit hard, and lots of atoms spitting out blue light, you get a blue flame. Here comes another science word. Ready? Chemiluminescence. I know, it's a big one. One more time. Chemiluminescence. It's when atoms shine light when they rearrange. It's why flames are blue. Now, the blue light is not hot. Wait! But the blue flame is really hot. So if the blue light is not the hot part, then what does make a flame so hot? Well, remember our fuel atoms and our oxygen atoms? They rearrange to make new stuff like water and carbon dioxide. And as they rearrange, they snap together. And with each, the new things shake like crazy. So when the rearranging is done, we have lots of new stuff, all shaking really fast. If we put something close to those raging atoms, well, those atoms begin to shake like crazy, too, like the atoms in our finger. And that's heat. This is called oxidation. It's when the oxygen atoms combine with other atoms to make new stuff. It's why flames are so hot. All right, then. Why are most flames yellow, orange, and red? Well, remember our first reaction? We had one group of fuel atoms and two groups of oxygen. They made a flame that was very hot and only blue. But watch what happens if there's not enough oxygen and we take some away. Ladies and gentlemen, what happens when there's not enough oxygen? So this, a single carbon atom was all alone. It's okay, because all of us leftover carbon friends come to join and they form large black particles we call soot. Okay, they're not so large. They're so small, we can't even see them. But to a single atom, they are enormous. Enormous! I know what you're thinking. How do black particles make yellow flames? Well, let me show you. But first, I need something big and black, like this pitchfork, for example. Excuse me, sir. Your evilness, could you please place your pitchfork into those scorching flames? Thank you. Big black objects are like sponges that soak up heat. They have to get rid of this energy, so they spit it out by glowing. The hotter they get, the more brightly they glow. Now, the same thing happens with our soot particles. They drink in the heat from all of those hot atoms, and they glow brighter and brighter until they look like this. And because there are millions and millions of soot particles all glowing hot, we get this yellow flame. This is called incandescence. It's when the soot particles glow because they're hot. It's the reason why flames are yellow. Well, that's it. That's what flames are. I mean, the new cupcakes give you so much fun. Remember, First, the fuel loses mass and turns to a gas. Before the next change is through, atoms shine blue. When the process is complete, it gives off heat. Extra carbon will glow red, orange, and yellow. Hey, those are just like the lyrics from that really awesome song about flames. You know, the one that goes, The fuel loses mass, it turns to a gas. Before the next change is through, some atoms shine blue. When the process is complete, it gives up. 
extra carbon will glow, red, orange, yellow. advanced stages of kingdom here. You know? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Right. Five. Okay, so I got another little video for you here, and this shows a practical application of fire science that I think you'll appreciate. I hope we call you the Jack Daniels method for on this <laughs> seven master distillers beginning with Jack himself. We've always taken this job very seriously, always required at least a seven year apprenticeship under the prior master distiller. This old office is the only original building left on the property somewhere in the 1870s, it's been restored to exactly as it was in Jack's day, and it served as her office till 1952. Here in the rickyard, we take sugar maple. It's cut into two inch by two inch boards, stacked into the piles of sea we call ricks. Take four of the ricks at a time, we place them under the burning hood, we take 140 proof whiskey, put some of that whiskey onto those ricks, light a match to it to start the fire. The reason we use the whiskey to start the fire is if we use any kind of a petroleum product to start that fire, it'll come out the taste of our charcoal. It takes about an hour and a half for these to burn down. We control the process with water. Our rickers know exactly when and how to spray that water to get the proper texture. When the fire is put out, we'll take the charcoal, crush it down to about a quarter of an inch consistency then use the charcoal to fill those charcoal mellowing vats. I can skip the rest of that. <laughs> oh, darn. <laughs> so we the samples. Out. Yeah, we don't get to the sample. <laughs> they don't let you sample their either. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> so. You need lemonade, right? Yeah. Hope somebody brought the bottle of Jack. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dry state. <laughs> so, yeah, that's pretty interesting. They've been doing that for seven generations or something. So that's you know? dried wood. They that's haven't run out of sugar wood. maples yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, that was an inspiration for a lot of us who were trying to find ways to make biochar from burn piles. In fact, uh, there's a uh, Forest Service soil scientist on the, used to be on the Umpqua named Jim Archuleta, who's put out a little paper for the Forest Service to look at 
called you know, the Jack Daniels method. And he came up with these different configurations he wanted to try. And they actually built some, some ricks, they're calling them ricks, um, on different projects on the Alcoa National Forest. But I don't, I haven't heard how they came out. But um, So this is a, these next series of pictures are from a um, project we did in fall of 2013 outside of Grants Pass. Um, uh, about 450 acres of <coughs> that was uh, uh, oak meadow restoration project. So the, the, the project was to, Lomakotsi did the work um, removing all these young small diameter firs and pines and making the standard burn piles. So we took a couple of days to go through and try different, this was the first time we'd done this. But we were, we, we, this was our chance to really try different um, stacking methods and pile construction methods to see how it worked. And it just worked amazingly well. Um, so is that dry or? Well, <coughs> you know, this was, in, uh, this was in October and the moisture level of the wood was between 15 and 30 percent. It had already rained a little bit, mm -hmm. but it was, it was really just perfect. So here, we took just some standard piles that had already been built, and we lit one from below. And what happens when you put the flame under cold, damp wood is it heats the wood and the gases rise, but the flame's underneath, so the gases don't burn. They make smoke. That's what smoke is. It's condensed volatiles, condensed into particles. Um, and so it's just as simple as when you light it on the top, same type of pile, um, the, the heat is transferring into the material by radiation. You don't need convection to burn these piles. Radiation and convection are enough. And as that gas rises, it burns in the hot flame and you have very little smoke. So to answer your question about moisture level, that's key. Really, you know, if you have 50% moisture, forget it. You're gonna have smoke no matter what you do. Um, but really, you know, so this one was fairly damp, but it, it managed to dry in the, enough in the process that we, it worked fairly well. So this is our, our procedure was, as these things burn down, then um, in order to save the charcoal, because, you know, it's all the process of the gas burns first, and then only after the gas is all gone will the charcoal start to burn. Um, but it's not that hard to interrupt that combustion process and save the charcoal by adding water. So what we learned was, um, you know, we're out in the woods. We didn't have a, we didn't always have, the hose could reach everywhere we were going. So we could, we had some bladder bags though. And one pile could be quenched with two bladder bags of water. And combined with spreading it out, because when you spread out the, the char, they cool and lose heat. So, um, how big was the bladder bag of water? Mm -hmm. Oh gosh, a standard Double. bladder bag. I don't know how many gallons. I think they're, they're like three or four. Three, three to four oh, okay. gallons. Yeah. Did, did all that wood break down the char, or was there still like some unburned there's, parts there's of wood? On, yeah, in the there's. Middle of the larger well, stuff. the very bottom. Yeah. You know, especially if you have large pieces on the bottom. Some of it won't burn, but that's okay. Yeah. You know, it, you just leave it there. It's it's all good food for microbes. And, yeah. you know. So with this process you did there, you didn't stack the wood a certain way. You just well, hang on, I'm going to show you. Some I mean, this process. So one of these standard burn piles um, gave us about 40 gallons of, of biochar. Wow. We measured it in a five-gallon bucket. So here's one after we did this for four days, and by the final day we're like, okay, we think we know something now how to make the ultimate pile. So we tried to do this like a Rick, like that Jack mm -hmm. Daniels Rick. Oh, yeah. And and the, these next slides show the kind of rules we came up with for constructing piles, and this is what we're going to do today. Um, so rule number one: the material size should be as uniform as possible, but for stability. You know, you're going to want to have smaller stuff on the, on the top and bigger on the bottom so it can hold itself up. And of course you want lots, lots of kindling and, and dry kindling and small diameter stuff on the very top where you're going to start it so you can get it going. The second rule, of course, is lighting on, on the top, not in the bottom. You know, um, 
they actually, you know, going back to the, the standard pile construction method out there, is you build the tinder box inside, like in the middle of the pile. You know, you build the base and then you put kind of a box or a space in the middle where you put small stuff. That's the standard way of doing it. So we put our tinder box on top. <coughs> and then the other, another point here is that, you know, the standard way is to use a drip torch. So you get accelerant dripped all through the pile. So of course you're gonna get flame underneath cold, wet wood. So of course you're gonna get smoke. So we don't use a drip torch. Um, if you're gonna use accelerant, you should try and just mist it over the top. What sort of accelerant would that be? Whiskey. <laughs> oh, yeah, whiskey. <laughs> you went to fries. Or gas or kerosene. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, or in my case, I brought my propane torch, which is my favorite method. <laughs> so rule number three is, you know, this is the rick construction. The space between the sticks should be roughly equal to the diameter of the sticks. So that lets air flow through the pile. That's really, really important. And then rule number four, as the pile burns down, you know, it's gonna fall apart and sticks are gonna fall out of it. And you know, if you if you have the ability to tend it and kind of push the unburned stuff into the middle and keep that heat zone, you know, tight and close, um, it'll it'll work much better. And this is picture is a really great illustration of um, what produces smoke. Here's this one stick sticking up here in the middle, way away from the heat, so it's cooling down and it's making smoke because it's still enough. You know, there's still vapors being released, but there's no flame, so it's making smoke. <coughs> so that's another reason to consolidate the pile is to avoid smoke. So at that last picture, that's the time to put the water over it? Not quite. Not quite? Not quite. You know, it's always a judgment call. You know, because <coughs> the smaller stuff is going to start turning to ash. What you can do is you can kind of like the Jack Daniels people do, you can use the hose to control it. So, you know, if you've got smaller stuff that's already starting to ash, you can just hit it with the hose. And meanwhile, the stuff in the middle is still going hot. So um, you can maximize your char production that way too. So the ash is not that beneficial? You can't really well, the, the deal, deal is what <coughs> ash is, is what's left over. And actually, I'll show a picture. Oh. Yeah. What, help me, can you get <coughs> you? We're looking at the flames and looking at the gas burning. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference? Can you tell when the, like say when there's no longer any gas there that's burning and that would be the time that you, you can, can, especially, yeah, because the flames go out. Mm -hmm. When flames go out, when the flames go out, that's when it's really time to think about quenching. Because mm -hmm. yeah, there's not enough gas to sustain a flame, that's time to quench. Um, so, and just, you know, to answer your question about ash, ash is just the minerals that are left over. So, you know, you have the wood, it out, out gases, you left the char, and then if you burn the char, the only thing left at the end is the minerals. So the calcium, the potassium, um, nitrogen will burn, but, you know, those kind of minerals are left, and that's the ash. And those, that's plant food, but it's also very alkaline. So you use caution when you use that in soil. You don't want to put dump tons of wood ash. And of course, I always put wood ash in my compost, so, you know, mixed with other stuff. Um, I, I was just going to say, in the last two days, I was looking up um, potash, mm -hmm. which is, which a lot of farm clearing, um, because they burned off so much wood, for them to have a side income, they actually took the the ash, put it in water, and created potash, That's which right. they were able to sell as a fertilizer source. So they they increased the the money coming off their property with the waste from yeah. burning the forest That's off. That's traditionally always how potash was made. Yeah. Look at the name. It's and potassium. I just realized that like two days ago. Yeah. I didn't <laughs> really. It was a, such a money maker. Yeah. So um, so this is a different kind of pile construction using a different feedstock. This is vineyard pruning, and they're able to make these giant piles using machines. Machines. You know, just, you know. <laughs> There's a lot of material, and this is a huge problem, especially in California. Gosh, yeah. You know, where they've got so many vineyards, and um, 
this probably, this, using a bulldozer to make piles using our forest slash would not work very well because we're, you know, unless you have a lot of uh, openness, exactly, because, you know, this stuff is gnarly. These are gnarly branches. So if you have a lot of gnarly kind of hardwood branches, you could do this. But for um, fir and pine, you know, they're logs and they would just, they would just, you know, lie down together and they, you wouldn't get the air space that you need. You don't so want to compact the soil either with the machines. Well, that's a whole other issue, yeah. yeah. I mean, we, what, <laughs> what we do, when we see machine piles, usually there's a lot of dirt in them too. Uh -huh. And that, it just doesn't work. It won't work. Oh. So, um, so anyway, but this works fairly well. And so here he is spraying some accelerant on the top. <laughs> and they blit it on the top. And they're now teaching these methods to some really big uh, wine companies like Gallo and they start to cool. use these. And it's cutting down on the smoke a lot. I mean, you still get smoke, you know, especially in something like this where it's not carefully constructed. Right. You know, the fire drops down below the unburned material and you, you get some smoke, but it's way cleaner than the other way. So a question about the big companies. Uh -huh. Are they tilling in the uh, charcoal into the soil? What are they doing with the results? I don't know yet. I don't know. This is very new. You know, these pictures are just from like six, a few months ago. So um, I'm sure they're interested in using it. I don't know exactly how they're using it. There have been a lot of studies of using biochar in, in vineyards. And it's clearly beneficial. But well, for example, I'd be using my pruning uh, for my fruit trees right now. Uh -huh. So would I put my charcoal results into my compost pile or into we'll the soil directly? We'll talk about that directly? this afternoon. Okay, thank you. Okay. So here it is. Obviously, it's time to quench. There's no flame. There's a covering of white ash. Um, I don't know if I would wait that long. I probably would have quenched it before this. And here's, they're sort of trying to consolidate the pile here. Mm -hmm. And now they've quenched it. There's a, it, it holds a lot of heat. It can take mm -hmm. a piece of work to quench it and put it out. You can pile by <coughs> that. Yeah. So uh -huh. there's the result. And uh, the other thing about this kind of charcoal, is it's really good quality charcoal. I talked earlier about all the different kinds of charcoal. It's, it's good quality charcoal. So that's what we're going to do. We're also going to drag out my, my kilns, cone kilns. I have two versions. One's a cone, one's an inverted pyramid. It's basically the same thing. Um, and this comes from a Japanese technology. Um, for a long time, I knew about these kilns. Other people in the biochar world knew about them, but we had no clue how they worked. <laughs> so based on a picture, I built one. I had a welder make me one. But it took me two years to figure out how to use it. <laughs> uh, yeah, and this is how it works. It's obvious, right? Yeah. <laughs> that was all the information I had. And finally I figured out, I think finally somebody wrote in Japan wrote a paper in English that, and again, it's not easy to tell what they're trying to say even when they're writing in English because <laughs> the translation is just... You needed a Japanese interpreter there. I, translate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I didn't know anybody. Anyway, um, that's how it works. Um, this is showing the kiln when it's almost done. And the key thing here is these arrows, because this is the key to how it's clean, also a very clean technology in terms of smoke production. You get this um, nice air vortex in here that keeps the flame tight over the, the biomass and makes for efficient heat transfer. So it very, this is one of the slide I wanted to show you about the stages of combustion. And so how the cone kiln works is basically by interrupting. So right here, we're gonna interrupt this. So, but this is of course how it works in the, in the pile too. You start with your biomass and it goes through the drying stage and then it goes through um, the volatiles burning, and that's also what we call pyrolysis. That's the pyrolysis stage from the video. Then you've got the char, and then the char can burn. And when, then you're left with ash after the char burns. But 
we're just going to cut this off right here. Um, because, and how would we do that? You know, there's different ways to save the char <coughs> to stop the combustion process. Here's your traditional fire triangle. So you need to remove one of these three things in order to stop the process. And um, so in our case, it's the oxygen. And here's a, just another nice little diagram, how wood burns. This is how it would burn in your wood stove. This is how you make, actually a lot of people make charcoal in their wood stoves if you have a really good airtight stove. You know if you shut it down, you know, you're gonna look with charcoal because at a certain point, you know, when the, you've got the, the logs, they, they're kind of not completely burned, but you shut it down, you're gonna end up with charcoal. And I know one guy who's been making like a gallon of charcoal every day. And that adds up. So that's an easy way to make it if you have the right kind of stove. So the way we cut off the oxygen with the cone kiln is we start it, we get a little bit of coals going, and the way it works is we just add the layers gradually. So whereas with the pile, we build it all at once and light it on top, with the cone kiln, we kind of build it as we go. It's the same idea of a rick but we build it as we go, and each new layer cuts off air to the layers below. So whenever, you know, it starts looking charred, and you start getting a little ash appearing on the sticks, that's the time to add a new layer. And you can see how clean that burns, because the flame is on top. Any smoke that comes out of there is getting burned. And by the time you fill this whole kiln, you know, the whole thing is full of charcoal. And I just hit it with the, water, the hose and quench it and unload my char. So let's go make some biochar. Uh, just a note, if you have a coffee cup, leave it at your chair to come back. Should I go ahead? Get somebody else up. Where are you going? We don't want to be too close to the table. <laughs> <laughs> no, I gotta, I'm just going to let you know, these are both for sale. Oh, yeah. That's good. $300. Uh -huh. That's good. So, wow. anybody wants to take one home? And you take special orders. 300 a piece, well, I would say. Come on, 150 each. Yeah. She <laughs> said both. $300, right? So, that means 150 each, right? <laughs>
The short ones either, huh? <laughs> oh, we got the short ones. This is getting really complicated. Yeah, right. oh, that's oh, the right. Okay, so there. And space them according to the depth of the wood. The thickness of the wood. How's that? Great, keep going. Perfect. We want to build it up about this high, so make oh. sure it's stable on the bottom. Put some bigger ones on there. Size. I'm not making it. 
Henry. That's what Jack Daniels called the Oh, Rick is usually a third of a chord. Oh, that's what I was going to say. Rick is a... Is a yeah. Okay, they're supposed to have a gap the size of the wood. Right. So, let's, let's keep the gap going there. Good job. There we go. We can put some yeah, longer ones on there now. Let's talk some longer ones. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we got. Actually, yeah, get a tape measure. We got a.
stuff. Nano kindling. <laughs> nano kindling, yes, that's it. We're down to nanos. So that torch, you can burn anything. I've got one of those suckers. Yeah, we can stop yeah. <laughs> don't, don't burn the lichens now. Get the lichens off of there first. Oh, that's right, Jim. Aren't good? Good fire starter? They are. They are, but I always hate burning that because it's oh. nitrogen, and when you burn it, the nitrogen falls. That might just take some time of preparing them, huh? Tinder. I got a really nice picture of a fairy behind the flame. to make sure it's a burn day? <laughs> <laughs>
build one as a pilot. And I'm trying to find funding actually to do a big feasibility study of these things because, you know, a cube, the things are huge. And you, if you have four of them and a crew of two people on a landing with plenty of forest slash, they could build, you do, they could do, run four of them in parallel. Like we could be doing this one right now mm -hmm. too. No, you can't just toss one back in. Midwest had a lot of um, biochar in them. From, That's right. 
some, um, and that was one of the reasons they were so nutrient dense. Yeah, that? that's why we grow corn in Iowa. It's yeah. such phenomenal rates because that soil has natural charcoal in it. Natural so, biochar from the prairie fire. Mm -hmm. The same thing, you know, um, frequent intervals of, of grassland fires. And what happens is that a nice hot fire in the t where the grasses are sticking up in the air, heat radiates down into the root zone. And I mean, you know, just above the roots, you know, the base of the plant, where there's it's very thick down there and there's not much air. So the fire blows through, it radiates down there, it chars a lot of the grass, and then, you know, the heat source is gone, so the char just cools, and, and that's how you get charcoal. Well, I wonder if that would be a way of regenerating land then that is, you know, has been scabbed if you could plant grass, burn it, plant grass, burn it. Oh, that's a great idea. You know, and use that as a way of Absolutely. regenerating it. Isn't that what the Indians did? They did under burning, yeah. Well, and people burn crops worldwide, you know, mm -hmm. and that's a way of getting, actually getting, mostly getting the minerals back in the soil mm -hmm. right away from the ash. Mm -hmm. But it's really interesting, you know, to start looking at traditional practices. So, you know, I think all of you have heard about the terra preta from the Amazon, probably. That's how we all got into the first. Well, now, you know, they're starting to look at all kinds of other traditional property practices and finding out that actually people were, were doing things like, you know, digging a, a trench and putting, you know, starting a fire and then covering it with soil to make charcoal. Mm -hmm. and, you know, they, all over the world, you know, Spain, Italy, Europe, mm -hmm. um, Africa, Asia. So, and, and it's interesting that a lot of people at trying to bring this biochar idea to developing countries where people don't have fertilizer. You know, they have, mm -hmm. and their soils are often really depleted of carbon, really poor soils. Charcoal can make a lot of difference. And they go into these communities and start talking about charcoal, and it's not that hard to get people to, to get it because it's really related to a traditional practice that maybe people are even practicing now because the Green Revolution came in and, you know, <laughs> the Europeans came and told them how to do agriculture with chemical fertilizer, right? So they're trying to do that and they're failing miserably. And so they go, oh, yeah, you know, Grandma used to do this. Sure, I get it. <laughs> Thanks for telling me, white man. <laughs> so, you know, that people that um, grow grass for a living, grass seed, and then they burn, like up in the but it causes a lot of smoke pollution. Right. So I wonder if there's a way they could do that. Well, that you know, be... one of the guys I work with, um, he's a consultant up in Portland, his name is Tom Miles. Um, in the 70s, he designed with a, designed a, a machine with a crop burner. It would just go through and burn the stubble, but it would, it would pyrolyze it, it would char it. So machine like a big harrow or something, but it had little propane burners. Yeah. It would just like pass over and just have enough flame there to char the stuff huh. without setting it all on fire. Right, right. Kind of like the sugar cane for about 30 years ago. In Canada, Mississippi, they had a huge field of cane and sugar cane. This is like a little volcano where the center is the hottest, uh -huh. and the parameter is like the last to get burned. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, here you'll see where though the difference between doing it in, in a contained vessel versus out in the open air. Yeah. You know, it does hold the heat a little more heat in, so it's yeah. going to go a little bit better. Huh. It. So I don't know if you guys have heard of the um, Umsa Bio Alternatives.
there was a, uh, an issue with doing pallets, uh, cut up pallets, because of the nails that were there. So, what we requested was what they were leaving behind. And as a result, is it now mixed into it or?